I'm going to be looking at King Jehoram in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, King Jehoram is the brother of King Ahaziah. And Jehoram becomes king because King Ahaziah has no son. So once again, you've got a son of Ahab and Jezebel. So he's not the king of Israel. His name means Jehovah is exalted. Although he's not doing much of that. His length of reign is 12 years. His parents, as I just said, Ahab and Jezebel. And his prophet, Elisha. His spiritual state is, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is a, another evil king. And mostly I'm going to be talking about the lesser of evil. The lesser of two evils does not mean he's not evil. Just because he's the lesser doesn't mean he's not evil himself. In 2 Kings 3, 1, it says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. So Jehoram is reigning over Israel at the same time that Jehoshaphat is reigning over Judah. Jehoshaphat, we've done some studies on him. He's a good king. And Jehoram is an evil king. But he reigns 12 years. And that's a pretty good while. Because imagine the length of time you were in first grade all the way up until you were in 12th grade. To give you an idea. That's a pretty good while. So somebody was in first grade and graduated from high school. That's the amount of time that Jer Jehoram was king. Jehoram did evil all those years. He's an evil king. But he isn't the most evil. Just because you are the lesser of two evils doesn't make you good. You'll notice that sometimes the Bible will compare people and say something like, He did, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like so-and-so. Obviously, both are still evil, but one is the lesser of two evils. And sometimes a person can look righteous when you stand them next to an extremely wicked man. When I was in school, there was this really bad kid named Cortland. And we thought this kid was the baddest kid that ever hit planet Earth. Until halfway in the school year, we got this new kid named Kevin Klein. Not to be confused with Calvin Klein. But he turned out to be the most evil. The most evil kid we'd ever seen. The teacher warned us ahead of time. She said that Cortland is bad, but this Kevin kid makes Cortland look like a little schoolgirl. Both guys were bad, but one of them was really evil. The reason behind me saying that is you can always find somebody worse than you. Um, the biggest troublemaker in your class, there's a bigger troublemaker somewhere. You know the saying, you can always find somebody bigger, or you can always find somebody better. You can always find somebody more evil. Many times a lost person thinks in their minds, they think, I'm doing pretty good because at least I don't do what so-and-so does. But that's where you're messing up. You think that since you're doing better than Kevin Klein, that you're doing pretty good, but you're forgetting you're not going to be compared to Kevin Klein or Cortland. You're going to be compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. And until you get his righteousness placed on your record, you'll always come short of the glory of God. But you get his righteousness by putting your trust in him and his finished work on the cross where he died for your sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. You get that on your record. When you get saved, you get his righteousness on your record. That's the only way to not come short of the glory of God. You can always find somebody worse. But these kings may have thought they were doing pretty good. I mean, Jehoram... He may have thought to himself, I'm doing a lot better than mom and dad, which was Ahab and Jezebel, two of the most notorious evil people in the Bible. So he thought, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing better than mom and dad, so I'm all right. I'm going to make it. I mean, but you all look good if you compare yourself to a serial rapist or a big-time bank robber or a baby killer. You can always find someone worse. So my first point is anyone can do better than the worst person. The worst person in your life, you're probably doing better than that person. 
In 2 Kings 3, 2, And he, Jehoram, wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. So he wrought evil. He worked or performed evil in the sight of the Lord. Everything you're doing is in the sight of the Lord. Where I'm from, all I hear is country music. And this one country singer plays this song that says, What happens down in Mexico stays in Mexico. And I, I've, I've heard that in stores and walking around places, and I'm thinking to myself, that's completely untrue. What happens down in Mexico is wrote on your soul if you're not saved, and you'll be judged for it. If you're saved, then it's wrote on your flesh, and you'll reap it in the flesh, and you'll lose eternal rewards. I mean, it's it's took a record of somewhere. Everything you did down in Mexico. Everything you did in Las Vegas. Everything you did at your girlfriend's house. All this stuff is wrote down. In Proverbs 15, 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. There's no secret chambers or hidden rooms in King Jehoram's castle that he could hide from the Lord. Everything that happened in the Playboy Mansion is recorded somewhere. Everything that happened in the Biltmore House is recorded somewhere. Everything that happened at Bohemian Grove is recorded somewhere. God took note of all of it. Nobody's getting away with everything. Luke eight seventeen says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. So, 2 Kings 3, 2, And he... Jehoram wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. He did evil, but not like his father and like his mother, Ahab and Jezebel. So there are different degrees of sin. There are people that are more sinful than others. One day God is going to open a book. With every single thing a lost man has done, and he's going to give that person possibly a greater damnation in the lake of fire for the things that he's done. He may have a greater damnation than the person that went before him. In Revelation twenty thirteen through 15, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works according to your works the more evil you do as a lost person the hotter hell is going to be the hotter the lake of fire is going to be and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire i mean jehoram is in hell ahab's in hell jezebel is in hell but one day they will stand before god and they will be judged out of the things written in the book. Jehoram may not receive as great a damnation as Jezebel or as Ahab, but he's still going to the lake of fire. Just because he wasn't as evil as Ahab and Jezebel, that didn't get him righteousness. In Luke 20, 46 through 47, it says, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. There's some people that's going to receive a greater damnation than somebody else. In John 19, 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So Jehoram didn't have a greater sin than his parents, but he was still evil. He got rid of the image of Baal that his father made, but he still loved himself first. Maybe he didn't fool with Baal because he was so much in love with himself. So, you don't have to be the most evil to be evil. It says in 2 Kings 3.3, 3, Nevertheless, he, Jehoram, cleaved into the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. 
which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. Remember Je Jeroboam, the guy who really got things going on in the wrong direction for Israel? I mean, he made his own religion to try and compete with pure religion. And I mean, I guess Jehoram got a hold of a satanic Bible, if there was one, by Jeroboam, and practiced all that satanic made-up religion that Jeroboam had. I mean, if there was a satanic Bible back then, Jeroboam probably wrote one. I'm not saying there was, but he probably wrote one. I mean, Jehoram probably got a hold of it, had it signed by Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey and Madame Blavatsky and those type of people. He cleaved to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. There is one good thing about sin, and that is you can depart from it. But he departed not therefrom. But you can depart from it. So just go ahead and do it now. It says in Psalm 34, 14, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Jehoram didn't depart from his sin. It says he cleaved to the sins of Jeroboam. That's a strong word if you think about it. Cleaved. The Bible says a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And God sees that marriage bond is a very strong thing that's that word cleave is very strong you become one flesh with your wife you cleave to her jehoram cleaved to the sins of jeroboam he was stuck to them sometimes sin gets such a hold of you that it's like trying to get out of a giant super glue spider web or something he cleaved to the sins of jeroboam in second kings 3 in verse 4, it says, And Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. So this Mesha guy is king of Moab. And remember where the Moabites came from. They come from that incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. And he was good with Israel, but... It came to pass, it says in verse 5, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So he rebels against King Jehoram, and this time Jehoram starts to show where he puts his faith, and it's not in the Lord. I mean, you and the Lord are the majority if he's on your side. It doesn't matter how many people you're going against. You and him are the majority. But Jehoram doesn't have his faith in the Lord. The evil heart has more faith in numbers. In 2 Kings 3, 6, And King Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time and numbered all Israel. He's trying to get a gang of people together. It says in verse 7, And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. Once again you see Jehoshaphat, and we've done a lot of study on him. We see him doing some stupid stuff. He's a picture of a compromising Christian. He's a picture of a Christian who may be sincere, but they keep trying to get along with the world. This would be like your Bible-believing pastor having a death metal band sing at your church before he preaches because he thinks it's going to attract the young people. But it just doesn't make any sense. We ain't as they are. We people ain't like them people. Our horses ain't like their horses. But Jehoshaphat says his famous saying, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. If your people are like the world's people, then you're hanging with the wrong people. If your horses are as their horses, then you need to get, you need to clean out your CD player in your car. Get the filthy bumper stickers off of it. Get the marijuana smell out of it. Get the beer cans out of it. Our cars are not the same as their cars. You ought to be able to tell the difference between a lost wicked man's car and a saved man's car because of what they got inside of it. You can tell what they're doing. In 2 Kings 3, 7 through 8, And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go against me to Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. 
If this is Jehoshaphat asking Jehoram, which way shall we go up? Then that's out of line. Because why is the righteous king asking the wicked king which way to go? It says in Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Jehoshaphat doesn't need to ask Jehoram which way to go. Second Kings 3, 9, So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. So when you take the world's way, you get short of water. Water is a picture of the word of God. A compromising Christian usually sacrifices his water supply. When you have a compromising pastor, one of the first things he's going to throw out is the word of God. He gets rid of his King James Bible. He gets a modern translation. And then his sermon doesn't even really use much scripture from any Bible, period. There's not much water there. So they had no water for any of the men or even for the cattle that followed them. And notice Jehoram's reaction. The evil heart he has blames God. In 2 Kings 3.10 it says, And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So he doesn't have anything to say about the Lord any other time until he wants to blame the Lord. He's saying that the Lord, for Jehoshaphat, has, has gathered Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, and himself together to be delivered into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Notice once again Jehoshaphat shows his true colors. He knows deep down who the real preacher is. He knows who has the goods and who's going to give it to him straight. And then one of the king of Israel's servants popped up and said, Here is Elisha. So I guess this servant here had secretly been listening to a bunch of preaching tapes from Elijah. He probably had Elijah's commentary series back home. He even knew who the real preachers were. Verse 12, And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So the three kings go down to see Elisha, and look what happens. You're going to see the spiritual recognizes the evil man. And 2 Kings 3.13, And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father, and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So when Elisha sees the king of Israel, he knows this guy's an evil joke. He says, get to the prophets of thy father and thy mother. He knows that his prophets are the prophets of Baal. He knows who his mom and daddy is. He knows the king of Edom is also an evil man. The spiritual can recognize the evil man. He has some spiritual discernment. Verse 14, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. So Elisha is saying that if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat being with them, that he wouldn't even look their way. He wouldn't even look toward them nor see them. But he says in verse 15, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. A minstrel is a guy that's going to come play some music on an instrument. And this is why most times you hear someone singing before the preaching. It gets you and the preacher ready for the preaching. So the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha when this music played. The king of Israel was probably saying, why is he playing this old stuff? I mean, he's, because Jehoram, he's used to, he's used to what they play at St. Jeroboam's Church of Self-Worship. He's used to that kind of music that makes you do want to twerk, not the kind that makes you want to march. But Elijah, he hears that music, he starts preaching, and he says in verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with the water that you may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. When you get the right man, when you get the right man in, he starts filling you up with water. When you go to church, it should be like taking your pitcher in, and the preacher or teacher just filling you up with water. Uh, most guys you listen to aren't giving you much water. It's good sermons, 
but it's not helping you grow. It's not making you want to dig yourself in the Word so that you can strike water for yourself. It's just a little bit shallow. shallow. I mean, not much there. I mean, it did the trick temporarily, but there's a big, big Bible in your lap full of all kinds of stuff, and they're just not giving it out. I mean, there's so much stuff to give out from the Word of God that I can't even find enough time to give it all out. If I don't give a, a big bite to you on your fork every time that you hear me, then I feel like I've just wasted your time. Some people say, well, you can't give it to them all at once. I know I can't, but most people are just using that as, as an excuse not to give anything at all. I mean, we can't give it all at once, but you can give some of it. Sometimes I listen to churches around my area on their live stream, and I'm, and I'm thinking, these people are going to hear this three times a week, and they aren't given any water to help them grow. It's waterless. It's a drought. They need Elisha to come in and fill the ditches with some water in there. Notice what Elijah says about their situation with the Moabites. In verse 18, And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. He said, This is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. Sometimes you forget how powerful God is. The stuff going on down here is kids' stuff. I mean, imagine your kids playing a game where they are opposing armies and they are going at each other. It would be nothing for you to step in and just stop them. Imagine if one group of ants was about to fight another group of ants. You could step in and wipe out one group so the other ants win very easily. You could rain down a pot of boiling water on them all and kill them. It's like that for God, except God is more advanced than you, even more than you are to the ant. It's a light thing for God to step in and deliver them into, the, into their hands. Paul calls what we go through in this life to be light afflictions. I mean, you have a God that knows the end from the beginning. He's came down and went through everything that you've been through, and he knows all things work together for good. So it's all just a light thing. It's nothing to the Lord. 2 Kings 3.18 And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and you shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. Notice that God is so far ahead of the game. He's a true man of war. He knows what's going to happen in the war before the war starts. He's omniscient. He, he knows everything. I mean, that's why I say if, if, if God's on your side, you and God are the majority. Verse 20, And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. So Elisha opened the spout, and the water came out. And there was water everywhere. And all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them. They gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. They heard the kings were coming to fight against them. Everybody that could put on armor went upward. But the armor isn't going to save you if you got their kind of armor because it's the wrong armor. You have to put on the whole armor of God. You can have all the things the world can put on you. But if it isn't of God... It's not going to have any you know, real effect. In Second Kings 3.22, And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. Uh, when the sun hit all that water that the Lord brought in, it looked red as blood. So Elijah brought water out that ended up looking like blood. Uh, Elijah does a miracle with water. Just like Moses turned the water to blood, the Lord Jesus Christ turned the water to wine, a picture of blood. 2 Kings 3.23, And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. So they think, the Moabites think, that Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and the king of Edom got into a big fight and killed each other. So they're like, let's all go get the spoil. The spoil is all the stuff that they can they can get their hands on. The enemy's horses, their goods, their food, the stuff in their pockets, everything. So they're going in there. They're thinking they're going to get all that spoil. And it says, and when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they had lied before them. 
but they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country. So the Moabites were coming in there without their game face on. They thought they were coming in to get the spoil. Israel just pounced on them. It says, And they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land, cast every man his stone, and filled it, and they stopped all the wells of water, and felled all the good trees. Only in Kirishath left they the stones thereof, howbeit the slingers went about and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him seven hundred men that drew swords to break through even into the king of Edom, but they could not. So he took 700 men that drew swords. One problem, just like they had the wrong armor, they got the wrong sword. They needed the sword of the Lord. They needed a sharp two-edged sword. They needed the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They needed Ehud's dagger. Uh, they needed a sharp two-edged sword. Those swords of those 700 men were like the swords you buy your kid at the Dollar Tree. If you're going to go against God, you need, you can't go against God like that. And see, if you're going against God, you're not, you don't have the right sword. You don't have the right armor. You can't fight against God and prosper. But if you're on God's team, then you've got the right sword. You've got the right armor. It says in verse 27, Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. The king of Moab took his eldest son, the one that would have been king after him, in his stead, and he took him and offered him as a burnt offering. You see how wicked these kings are? A man that can kill his own kid is full of the devil. It says he departed from him and returned to their own land. They went back where they came from. Just like the devil, after he tempted the Lord a few times, he departed from him for a while. You see, just keep relying on the Lord to win the battle, and a time of rest will come.